feel for where we're going with the broader HANA technology going forward. So whenever we talk about roadmap, it's really important for us to put up the disclaimer, which basically says that although we, we, we're talking about stuff in the future and we may or may not deliver this content as it, as it goes on. So if you've been engaged with SAP for any time, you probably would have seen this slide. Um, this is SAP's overall high-level strategic focus, and that's to produce the intelligent enterprise. And if you break this down, it's, it's a combination of pulling in what we call experience data and aligning it with operational data and thereby creating some form of intelligence out of this data. So that's great for a very high-level slide, but what does it actually mean? And, and that's really taking all of the softer kind of fluffy, undefined information about what customers think about you and your service, how your brand is perceived in the market, how your employees are enjoying working in, um, in your company, um, and how your product is, is seen out there in the market, are people satisfied, and, and trying to pull all of that what we call experience data and combining it with the data, the operational data that SAP has been delivering for the last 40 years. And this is, you know, your finance data, your manufacturing, your HR data, uh, your network data, all of this stuff we've done for many years and combining it. But for the purposes of this um, discussion, it's really about that stuff in the middle. It's the digital platform that is gonna be used to combine these two areas of information together. And in our case, it's, it's, it's the HANA platform. And from this, you can see that the HANA technology is absolutely core and critical to where SAP is going in the future. It's the actual keystone of, of SAP strategy going forward. All of our standard products are now starting to run on HANA and only on HANA. So if anybody doubts uh, SAP's commitment to HANA, that they, they, they should um, <laughs> stop that doubt at this point in time. So what I'm gonna cover today is, is, is a, a really brief look at um, the HANA roadmap, um, mostly focused on, on premise. And then we're gonna spend some time looking at the new stuff that's coming out, um, which is SAP HANA Cloud. And then a product which you may or may not have heard of yet, which is the SAP Data Warehouse Cloud. So really the big news, I think for maybe quite a few of you is there's a different way that you produce software when you write it for cloud versus any premise. And what I mean by any premise is any premise is either software that you deploy in your own data center on premise, or if you decide to roll out software to infrastructure as a service, so the Azure's, the, the Google clouds, um, when you deliver software, which is a cloud-based software, you have to design and build it very differently because you have to take advantage of the hyperscalers capabilities and that's things like being able to hibernate services, be able to expand and contract services at, at will. Um, and so you really have to build the software in a completely different manner. So the big news is that the HANA code line is now going to be splitting into two versions. And there's gonna be one version which is focused on the on-premise delivery of, of HANA going forward. And then there's gonna be another version which forms the basis for our HANA in the cloud, which underpins a lot of our other HANA offerings in the cloud. So they're gonna share a lot of components and there's gonna be cross-pollination between these two code lines. So when we delivered functionality in the cloud, we may or may not port that back down to on-premise. Um, and we're gonna be maintaining these two versions for some time to come. The on-premise version, the absolute focus, probably about 70 to 80% of the um, engineering effort is going to go into what we call quality and resilience. And that's just making sure that the software becomes more and more bulletproof um, uh, over time. And um, so it's really a focus on getting rid of all the technical debt we've accumulated in the product and just making it rock solid with some additional features coming out. So there is still gonna be more functionality delivered on premise, but a lot of the engineering focus is around moving to the cloud as all software vendors in the globe are moving to the cloud. And that really goes towards operational automation, cost efficiencies, being able to take advantage of 
cloud services like being able to have software that grows and shrinks, um, that you can hibernate, that you can simply take over immediately and, and, and integrate into things like shared services. So for example, you know, there's a lot of talk about blockchain out there. Uh, would we deliver a blockchain engine within HANA? And the thought process is no. You know, the, the hyperscalers are delivering blockchain as a service and we would probably integrate to that rather than deliver it delivered ourselves. So that's all about the shared services and then obviously getting rid of for the data readiness. So what you're going to see going forward is that the on-premise version will continue to deliver uh, service pack updates on a yearly basis as we have done in the past. Um, and then the cloud version will be delivering, I suppose you can say the equivalent of service packs on a, um, on a, on a monthly basis. So much faster approach to uh, delivering functionality in the cloud. And that's primarily because a lot of our options in the cloud will be based on a managed service. So it becomes immaterial for you to have to worry about doing the upgrades uh, to a large extent. <clears throat> so not, not, not much has changed <clears throat> on um, uh, the deployment options. We've still got the ability to either run it uh, HANA as a managed service or bring your own license or on premise, we've got the appliance, the teledata center integration, and then a lot more support recently for what we call hyper-converged infrastructure. We're supporting a lot more vendors in that space. So for the purpose of this discussion, I'm, I'm, I'm really talking about um, uh, the what we call the native HANA use, the, the full use HANA, uh, rather than the runtime HANA underneath uh, SAP applications. The runtime HANA is essentially a black box and whatever functionality the application needs, it will be consumed out of the runtime version. Whereas if you're trying to look at what the roadmap is doing and, and where the product is going, it's more focused on the full use um, native HANA uh, capabilities. So if we look at uh, the on-premise capabilities, and this is the full stack that we've you've got to know over the last you know five to to seven years, it's all of the engines, all of the capabilities, the the SDA, the SDI, all of that, um, and this is the the area that we're talking about um, at at this point. So if we look at the roadmap, um, I think one of the big news is news is that the next version of HANA 2.0, which is SPO5, is scheduled for release in June. So that's about a month away or so. And the big news about this release is it's going to be on a five-year maintenance strategy. And the reason for this is that customers were feeling that they were getting um, pushed, encouraged to upgrade sooner than they wanted to. They wanted to be able to you know, develop code and have that run for an extended period of time without having to change the engine underneath. So SPO5 will be supported until 2025. And then there was a lot of talk in the market about, you know, is this the last version of HANA seeing you go to the cloud and when is HANA 3.0 coming out? Well, the plan at this stage is that SPO6 will be released in 2021. And um, that's also probably going to have a longer maintenance timeline. So customers who want to consume HANA on premise will be able to have a, a long term stable deployment. And um, we're certainly not announcing any uh, uh, depreciation of HANA on premise at all. The roadmap items that we are probably going to see coming out in 2020 with the SPO5 release. And there's going to be a whole series of webinars that are going to be announced by SAP to, to go through each of these areas in a whole lot more detail and and, dis and explain exactly what components are in or out of, of that release. Um, so I encourage everybody to join those sessions. Um, they're generally very good and they're generally very focused. So some of the things that are going to be coming out are, you know, the ability to back up your HANA instance into a cloud-based um, solution. So, you know, potentially doing your HANA backups into an S3 instance, for example. A lot more um, effort on the um, actual management of the solution, um, primarily around the HANA cockpit, a lot more control about what's going on, a lot more ability to analyze the what's going on in your system. Um, and to separate different workloads. Um, as far as data management, um, the, I think the big news there is we're going to be supporting um, 
uh, NSE for scale out. Um, NSE is native storage extensions. For those who don't know what that is, it's, it's something that we introduced recently, which is a great win for customers and allows them to offload warm data uh, onto a disk store and essentially get a lot more capacity out of their HANA box without paying a whole lot more. Um, we've had some local customers using NSE and it seems to be working really well and giving them good performance, but then some of our customers with scale out start to ask about, you know, when is their support for scale out and that's going to be happening um, very shortly. Uh, some focus on security um, and then a big focus on expanding out the machine learning predictive um, capabilities within the software and then more support for the web IDE. Um, we're going to be introducing core system notation, which is kind of a an extension of CDS uh, capabilities. It's the way that SAP is going with some modeling capability. Um, all of the, the capabilities that uh, you've got used to when the moving from um, uh, uh, XSC and a classic to XSA are still going forward. We're still supporting um, XSA and the HDI um, capabilities on premise. So I know that's a very, very brief look at what the roadmap is, but I thought a lot of people would be more interested in finding out uh, the longer term future where HANA is going. And this is really about um, uh, the new product that we've taken out to market, which is SAP HANA Cloud. Uh, and a lot of people are saying, well, you're introducing SAP HANA Cloud. We've heard about Data Warehouse Cloud. Uh, what does that mean for BW4 on HANA? What does that mean for native SQL data warehousing? And the official statement of direction is we're going to be um, following both these routes because certain customers will want to go to the cloud and other customers will want to stay on premise. So long term roadmap for HANA native supporting SQL warehousing and a long term roadmap for BW4. So customers who want to continue to run on premise or infrastructure as a service, there's no big push to get you to Data Warehouse Cloud, but those customers that are wanting to move into a cloud, we've now got a, um, a cloud-based solution, and we, we expect to see a lot of customers that will be building hybrid scenarios, um, taking some of their data into the cloud, but having you know the bulk of their data sitting on premise for the time being, and over the next year or so, we, we'll probably see more data moving into the, into the cloud uh, than on premise. The so question some people may be asking, well, didn't you have a cloud-based solution and wasn't it called HANA service? And the answer is yes, it was. And the, the news there is that um, we've discontinued HANA service and we've replaced that with HANA cloud. And the reason for that was that HANA service was um, a bit difficult for customers to deploy because there were two versions of this available, the one and the, and the version two, and some were deployed in, in NEO, which is SAP's data centers, and others were deployed in Cloud Foundry, which was the hyperscalers. So we wanted to come to, well, there were some other cap uh, restrictions, um, you know, there was fixed sizes uh, available. Um, there was differences between standard and enterprise edition available, so we thought we'd simplify that and come to market with one HANA cloud base capability, which is HANA cloud, and that would be based on version two, be based on Cloud Foundry, and it wouldn't have the restrictions on a, um, a fixed size, and it wouldn't have the distinction between standard and enterprise. So going to HANA cloud, essentially that is a managed service. Um, SAP take care of prov provisioning the hardware, the operating system, and the base HANA release, and maintaining the base HANA release. And then what customers will do will be to provision the capacity and, and select which services they want to run and then go into the actual design and, and building and doing the data modeling and building the application on top. So HANA Cloud is a managed service. Um, all you have to worry about is actually using uh, HANA uh, by itself. When we, when we describe uh, what this is, it's... Um, really composed of the core engines that you've known over time, um, which is the SQL, the, the spatial, the graph engines and those. But then we've got some kind of extended capabilities in HANA Cloud. The first one is, is the kind of combination of the virtualization capabilities and the replication capabilities into what you're going to hear of, which is something called Data Fabric, and I'll discuss that just now. But there's built-in support out the box for native storage extensions, and we're going to see customers using the native storage extensions in the cloud uh, 
uh, we expect to see them using it quite a lot. And that, again, brings down the cost of HANA in, in, in the cloud because you have a very powerful warm store of data, which is controlled by the HANA engine. Then the new item, which you may not have heard of yet, is the relational data lake service, which is part of HANA Cloud. And HANA Cloud is a, a, a Docker-based container service, um, so we can take advantage of, of, of that kind of cloud-based infrastructure. So the relational data lake is, we've taken the SAP IQ technology, the old Sybase IQ technology, and we've Kubernetesized it, and we've hooked it up and made it part of the HANA Cloud capabilities. So this allows you to store huge volumes of data in the cloud in a very high performance columnar store, disk-based store that's tightly coupled uh, and, and with optimized access into the, the HANA database. So it allows you to build a very large data warehouse in the cloud, which are without incurring the HANA in-memory um, costs that you may have seen on-premise. So from a storage perspective, we've seen obviously the in-memory as the, the, the highest value area, the fastest performance, then the native ex storage extensions, which is a warm layer, also extreme performance, but a much lower cost. Then we go into the relational data lake, which is tightly coupled as part of the HANA cloud. And then we have the ability to reach out and store and, and, and work with the hyperscaler uh, data storage like the S3, the Hadoop, the HDFS um, in, in the hyperscalers. So I mentioned previously that um, we, we're talking about what we, what we call in data fabric tables. And this is where we've combined the SDA virtualization and the SDI replication capabilities essentially in, into one construct. So you can have a table that at the flick of a switch, you decide you want to use virtualization and when you run the query, it goes down to the the external system and runs the query there, or you flick at a switch and you say, I want to have actually a, a cached snapshot of that table sitting in the HANA cloud, or you flick a switch again and it becomes a live replication table being up to date with the external system. So very interesting concept. And um, that whole process of data fabric tables can then store the data either in memory on the NSC or in the relational data lake capabilities. From a um, a feature scope, I've included the slide. You will get the slide afterwards. I don't expect everybody to read it, but this is a useful slide for those DBAs to say, well, what is actually in HANA Cloud versus um, not in yet or never coming um, uh, on the planning? And you'll see in certain instances, there's uh, we we don't have it yet, but we plan to bring it out in the very near future and align it with that with the um, the monthly kind of rollouts. And then we have the stuff which is not planned at this stage um, and we may not bring it in or if customers say they really, really need this, then we will reconsider that and, and potentially put it in. So the last thing I want to chat about really is the new capability that we bring in out, which is built on top of HANA Cloud. So Data Warehouse Cloud is built completely and utterly on top of HANA Cloud. So this leads into, into this capability. And useful to say, well, what problem are we trying to solve here? And the problem is that most companies that we deal with, they've got a centralized data warehouse, EDW, where you know, it's all secure and um, the data is governed one central version of the truth. And then what happens time and time again is that users request a, an extract of this data and they start working on this data and they, they start to share that data, they start to combine it with other bits and pieces of data. Um, and then this just results in the classic shadow IT problem where you've got no idea who's got hold of this data, how they've uh, massaged the data and what version of this data is and who they're providing this data to. So this is a classic problem that most IT organizations um, have provided. So we, with Data Warehouse Cloud, are trying to solve this problem. And the core area where we're trying to solve this is Data Warehouse Cloud brings in the concept of spaces into data warehousing. Now, think of data spaces as workspaces, virtual areas, although they're not strictly virtual where you can store data in, but the idea being that 
you have your data in the in the central point or you have a central access from from that central point onto on-premise data and then say the the finance group or the marketing group come to you and they say well look they really need an extract of this data because they want to work with it and instead of providing them with an extract you simply provide them with the space which has access to that data and then they can load data into that space and massage it but we are still maintaining the governance and the single version of the truth and they're working on one copy of data um, in that particular space um, a lot of the analysts have, have said that um, they really like this concept um, going forward spaces will be able to share data with with other spaces at this point in time they can only share data off the central repository um, and I know I'm going through this at an extreme pace but <laughs> I've only got 15 or 20 minutes so the first big news about uh, data warehouse cloud is, is this idea of spaces uh, which are uh, seem to be very very useful the second area is that uh, you can think of data warehouse cloud divided into two areas. The, the, the bottom layer is the data layer, and that, for all intents and purposes, is HANA Cloud. All the stuff where you build and you model and you create your graphical calculation views and you provision your data. But then we're introducing a business layer capability on top of that, which is your semantic layer. And I suppose think of it slightly in terms of the business objects universe, and this is where we, you would allow the business users access to your direct access to your EDW via a space and they get exposed to semantic context like customer or product or price and they can model and combine the data at that there. But it's very much allowing um, the, the power users, um, business users access to your data that's built on the data layer, which is the trusted source of the data. So that's going to be a really interesting stuff, and we expect the, the business layer to, to be introduced, um, I think, uh, in H2 or the second half of this year. Along with that, we're going to be providing content, and that content is, is not only going to be to allow you to connect into SAP systems, your BW systems, your S4 systems to automatically pull content into the data warehouse cloud, but we're also going to be providing content to allow SAP Analytics Cloud to directly consume the SAP Data Warehouse Cloud. Just for interest's sake, um, Data Warehouse Cloud can can come with an in, inbuilt SAC tenant, or you can connect SAC tenants, external SAC tenants, to a Data Warehouse Cloud and consume the data. And then we are also expecting partners to come uh, to the party and bring uh, pre-built data models for various industries or, or line of businesses and deploy them in the data warehouse cloud in both the business layer and the data layer uh, along with content to allow SAP and this cloud. What data warehouse cloud is not at the moment and at least not for the next couple of years is not a replacement for BW4. It certainly hasn't got anywhere close to the analytical capabilities of BW4 or the richness of content. But you may, may find in three years' time, um, customers may be deciding to deploy Data Warehouse Cloud instead of BW4. But that, that again, is, is, is a number of years off. So the, the real focus of Data Warehouse Cloud, the sweet spot is really about extending on-premise Data Warehouse solutions into the cloud getting a feel for how HANA Cloud and Data Warehouse Cloud works uh, off-premise and the integration capabilities. Or if you suddenly got a requirement to build a small data mart um, in the cloud and you don't have any capacity on your existing HANA servers, this is a great way to, to, to spin up capacity in an elastic, um, cost-efficient manner with the, all the storage capabilities uh, to, to swing it up into the cloud. So I think my time is, is up at the moment. And um, thank you very much. So, Johnny, I don't know if you want to take over now. Perfect, Roger. Sorry, I had a bit of a technical problem there for a second. Um, OK, I just want to confirm. Um, can everybody see my screen? Not yet. Not yet. OK, let's just give it a second. The bottom is.
Roger, you'll let me know if you can see the screen. It still hasn't come up yet. Okay. This, for everybody else on the call, this worked perfectly yesterday in the dry run, um, but we do you expect that. Yes, we are seeing your screen now. All right, excellent, excellent. I just want to get rid of this box, sorry. All right, thank you, everybody. Um, sorry for that technical hiccup. Um, okay, so my name is Johnny. I'm from Esri, South Africa, and I'm the Customer Engagement Coordinator. Um, essentially, I help customers um, do strategies and roadmaps based on whatever requirements they might have. And uh, the topic for today would be then the ArcGIS and SAP HANA and how you bring your data to life with those two platforms. Um, what I would like to do is give a very quick overview of, of Esri, just a slide or two, for those that might not be familiar with the ArcGIS platform. And then um, the bulk of the presentation will be on explaining the importance of data in the SAP and ArcGIS relationship, and then to focus on how these two platforms work together um, to give their users value out of, out of the relationship of those two solutions. So um, the first is the Esri overview. Um, Esri is the world leader in, in GIS software development. Um, we are the global leader, as I said, and um, we've got more than 100 offices worldwide and professionals from over 60 co uh, different countries. Um, we are widely represented in major companies as well as in the private and public sector, as well as um, in academia. And um, there's a brief table just to show with the various solutions and leading technologies that we have partnered with and we do integrate with. And uh, this is just to give an overview of, of how we um, try and uh, accommodate the clients and, and bring together solutions on our, on our platform. Um, also, 30% of our annual revenue does go towards research and development. And um, this is so that we can make sure that we don't just solve today's problems, but also problems that might, might arise in the future. Um, we also represent that in quite a few industries, um, like I said, in the private public sector, as well as NGOs, and NPOs. And um, we try and meet um, with our clients and create solutions to solve business needs from a day-to-day -day basis, um, as well as, as future operational issues. Um, the idea of solving uh, current issues, of course, is important, but, but being proactive and looking at problems that will arise in the future is kind of what drives the development of the software. Now, um, the sorry about that. There's a there's a quite a famous saying in in GIS um, that brings us to today's discussion, and that is that eighty percent of all data has a spatial component. Now, I don't know if this is scientifically proven, uh, but a lot of data previously considered to not have any spatial component can in fact be represented spatially. Um, spatial data can be anything from, from numerical to descriptive um, and, and comes in various forms and can be communicated in different ways. Now, the concept of GIS seems to be around 30, 40 years old, but, but humans have been using it for a much longer period of time, um, whether it's communicating spatial information about early societies and, and where to, to find animals for hunting, that, that essentially is a GIS. It's, it's data that is stored in your memory, and then based on changing conditions, you decide to undertake a specific action. Um, so, so GIS is, is essentially that. It's looking at data, um, understanding conditions, and then taking action. A few examples of spatial data. Um, here's a table that shows your, your X and Y coordinates, which most people are familiar with. Um, and those coordinates can be represented using different systems. Um, and that's the traditional sense of, of geographic data. But if we look at a different table, um, something that might not be quite as obvious, but is in fact geographic data, is something like an address. Although it doesn't necessarily um, give a visualization of a point on a map, it does in fact describe a very specific point. Now, even, even the name of a city, essentially what that is, is, is a polygon. That, that represents a specific uh, a specific space. And the same can be said for a SG code, which is a unique property identifier. Although it does not look at all like it's spatially enabled, in fact, that specific code represents a very specific point in space. And then there's many other examples that one can, can use. Now, the collaboration between 
Esri and then Sap Hanna, um, essentially seeks to to combine data um, for a specific uh, location. This data can be then combined. If we use an example of of a property, um, there are different there are different data sets that can be linked to that property. That can be billing. It can be ownership. It can be the receiving of of um, public services. And what what SAP Hanna does so well is it, it, it's able to store and retrieve data so efficiently that this data can be combined and then put into a GIS platform or information products where you can actually visualize and do analysis and get various insights on this data that wasn't available before. So essentially, the, the, the power of SAP HANA and the analytics, the spatial analytics of ArcGIS is what makes this relationship so beneficial. Now, these two platforms should not be seen as, as, as separate. Um, it is not a traditional in integration because the the special component in, in HANA is in fact ESRI. So ESRI lives inside SAP HANA. So it is not an integration. They actually are contained within each other. Now, when, when using ArcGIS and you would like to connect to a SAP HANA database, again, it's not an integration. You, you are just able to search for the database and bring the data directly in. So there's a direct link between the two platforms. So it's not a traditional integration. Um, these two are strategic aligned partners, which indicate that the potential for these two systems to work together and then serve the needs of the customers is quite big. Now, to discuss it in more detail, um, ESRI and SAP have partnered for more than two decades, and they bring together technological innovation and business value to the mutual customers. The, when looking at enterprise system, um, it can function as part of a system of record, engagement, and insights. And the, the partnership between the two platforms can assist on all these functions. So specifically as a system of record, the, um, you can integrate ArcGIS to your SAP resource planning or asset management system, and then you are able to streamline business processes and workflows. Um, this can be done using the RESTful services, and you can synchronize authoritative information in real time between these two mission critical systems. Then, as a system of engagement, you can support your workforce in the office and field, and then you can leverage ArcGIS mapping platform to bring the, the data that is stored in HANA database to life with various interactive maps, applications, and you can enable everybody in the organization to discover and make use of these um, shared maps and uh, these browsers that are compatible with tablets and phones, or you can even write your own using various SDKs, and um, you can provide your workforce with an on-demand access um, for, for maps uh, regarding the assets and resources to facilitate the collaboration between the data-driven um, map decision-making. As a system of insights, the using ArcGIS and SAP HANA, you can bring comprehensive location analytics to visualize the data, and you can then use ArcGIS Pro um, with, with various, various tools such as R Bridge or Python notebooks to access these capabilities. And um, you can include various demography, demographics, weather data, traffic, and any other data that is housed within SAP HANA. Then um, just to discuss these, each, each one of these in more detail, um, as a system of record, HANA stores geographic information natively because there is a geodatabase in HANA. As I said earlier on, the, 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 the spatial component is in fact ESRI. So, so if we have to use the same example that we used earlier on of properties, and you are now wanting to capture in, in your system of record data regarding a property, you will capture the traditional information such as the unique codes, um, ownership details, um, various attributes, and then in the same transaction, you're also then able to capture the geographic um, side of it. So the geographic data, whether that be your coordinates or, or, or any other geographic data that you would like to, to capture within the single transaction. So in essence, you will be using one, one method to capture all the data and you will be capturing geo-enabled data at once without any further work being done onto the data. You don't have to go back and retrieve the, the data that you've captured and then give it a coordinate. It's all done within one transaction. 
Now, the advantage of, of using this method is that it reduces cost and also it makes the data capturing process more efficient. Now, secondly, if we look at the system of, of engagement, yeah, you'll be able to, to make information available to stakeholders by combining the data that has been captured. And there are numerous possibilities for apps or platforms that can be used to serve this data um, to, to stakeholders or to people that are, that are needing the information in the field. Now, if we use the same example as before of properties, um, you can then take various data, various other data sets relating to that property and you can combine them. So in the previous example, we wanted to capture a property as well as its geographic location and the various attributes with that property. But within SAPANA, if you've stored information on billing um, or evaluations or any aspect of that property, such as rates accounts and solid waste removals or even water consumption, and you've got all these different tables that relate to this property, you can then combine them all together and serve all that information as an information product via the GIS or on ArcGIS. And the method by which you can serve this information it can be a website, it can be a, a viewer, online viewer, um, or it can even be an ex completely external facing um, uh, external facing uh, web service that can, can indicate non-payment of accounts, uh, something that's public facing that the public can log in and they can see. So, so your data that is being captured can then be served in all these different ways as a, as a system of engagement. Again, this is possible on mobile apps as well as normal web applications um, to serve this information to the various stakeholders. Now, the, the last one is the system of insights, and this is probably where, where the relationship of, of SAPAN and ArcGIS is most valuable. The spatial analytics that, that, that can, can be done um, is in ArcGIS is, is aided by the speed of, of SAPANA. So you consuming the data straight from SAPANA, which has got great performance, and then delivers delivers that data without any delays and without without causing backlog. And then the combination of these two platforms will allow the customer to easily get the information that is required from the data and allow them to make decisions based on sound analytics. And this is easy to use applications. Um, and and uh, this all happens at incredible speeds um, because of SAP HANA and the analytic capability of ArcGIS. Um, and like I said, it's the system of insights that probably receives the biggest advantage from using these two platforms together. Now, just by um, way of example, there are there are two examples that I would like to show where this has been done. Okay, so the first one is a um, what we call an operational dashboard, um, and this is an example of of a SAP HANA and ArcGIS integration. Specifically, what is happening here is um, it's, it's, it's an example on where SAP HANA has been used for you, a, um, a, a electricity, uh, electricity network and the infrastructure that goes with that. And you will see that there are various ways that you can represent the data. Um, you, can, you can use pie charts. Again, remember all of this data is coming from SAP HANA and then it's being, it's being used by the dashboard to, to, to show the data in different ways. So you can use various charts, you can use numbers, um, as well as use dynamic mapping. So the spatial component is being displayed on the map and the attribute components are being displayed on, on the various graphics you see. Um, things like, like, like photos and media can be incorporated. Um, the map is a dynamic map. So as you move around the map, it will update automatically. And, and the updates happen very, very quickly. You'll see there's very little delay in displaying the information. And this is once again, owing to that speed which SAP HANA is able to, to serve the data. Um, and then there's your normal cartographic things such as your legends um, and, and, and the usual things you would expect to see. A second example um, is the ArcGIS insights. So as the name would suggest, this gives more insights into your data. The, again, we, we are pulling data from a SAP HANA database. Um, on the left-hand side of the screen, you will see the, um, the various data sources that you can connect to. 
And then what we can produce are those sort of dashboards that you see there. This is very easy to do once again. A lot of it is drop and drag. Um, you will not need any programming skills. You literally are pulling the data from the SAP HANA database onto the, um, the working platform. And then that is immediately starting to calculate um, and, and, and do the displays. Again, we can display the spatial components which are captured in GIS, as well as then show various graphs and insights into, into the data. Um, it is very customizable. And um, the data can be represented using various formats um, and analysis can take on various forms. Um, so as you can see, a heat map um, as well as a tree graph. And, and the, the, the powerful thing here is that, that you very quickly can create information products that are, are, are reusable and um, it, it, it's very customizable. Um, you know, in this example, there's just a few examples of what you can do. Um, and then, of course, this thing can be shared to people within your organization, um, and, and very quickly those people can get very valuable information. Um, again, what, what makes this so powerful is the speed at which SAP HANA can work, and then the analytic capability of ArcGIS. Now, traditionally, um, if you are just a normal traditional GIS user, you can still leverage off of SAP HANA. Um, and here's an example of how a, a G enterprise GIS deployment um, uses SAP HANA to, 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 to give it extra power. So SAP HANA can form part of a distributed web GIS. And as the platform that holds all the organizational data at the head office, it can serve the data to the satellite offices without having to store their own data locally. So then again, this is possible because SAP HANA is so good at storing and, 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 and serving that data. Now, the advantage of, of, of using SAP HANA to, to deploy your enterprise GIS is that it simplifies the GIS architecture of the organization, and then it allows also for less points of failure. Um, as, as, as such, even the standalone solution that SAP HANA and ArcGIS um, work together very well. So even if you're not using SAP as an ERP, SAP HANA can still be used as a component within the GIS, and it, and it, just, it just gives that, that enterprise GIS so much more um, power behind its, its data management. Now, um, in just closing off, I'd like to, to mention a few important points. Um, so SAP and, and, and ESRI have had a partnership for many years, um, spanning over two decades. And um, there seems to be a very strong interest from, from the ESRI clients on, on how to incorporate um, SAP HANA into the, into, the, uh, into the enterprise GIS. And, and also we have had clients that are using SAP that are also very interested in, in leveraging off of, off of ESRI's spatial analysis um, capability um, in order to get more insight into their data. So, so it's, it's, it's a very good relationship for, for both platforms. And um, what, what, makes it so what makes it so desirable also is that it's, very, it's become very easy um, and simple to, to couple the two systems together. Um, and there's been many successful integrations between the two business systems. And um, the, its simplicity has also allowed us to establish very specific workflows um, on, on making the two systems collaborate with each other. And um, each, each one of the two has their own strengths. And, and by, by combining the, the, the two powerful systems, we are able to, to allow the clients and the users to get a lot of value um, from, from each of the platforms by using them in combination with each other. Um, in terms of material and, and, and workflows on, on how the two work, um, there's, there's a lot of information that's available, um, both from the SAP side and ESRI side. Um, training on all software is, is, is available. Um, ESRI Press releases books and material on relevant topics, and these can be used for, for knowledge buildings. Um, there are many online courses that can assist any, any users in upskilling themselves and using the software. And then also the e-certification on the, on the software which, which we do provide. Um, thank you. For, thank you very much for your time. Um, apologies, I seem to be having quite a few difficulties working with this today. Obviously, yesterday was the dry run; everything went went smoothly. Uh, but thank you very much for your time, and uh, I hope you found that uh, interesting. Genevieve, back to you. Perfect. Thank you very much, Johnny, and thank you, Roger, um, for taking the time and presenting this morning. Um, just a note to everybody, all presentations as well as the recording will be available on the AFSAC website.
You do need to be a paid up member as well as have login details for the actual um, to gain access onto the website. And yes, if you have any questions, you can just contact me directly. Thank you. Genevieve, I'm just trying to look at the chat to see if we can see any questions. I'm not sure that there are any. No, I have been monitoring the questions. Okay. There was one from Andre from Glue Data, which I see um, Roger did uh, okay. respond back to him for questions. There's a question that's just come in. It looks like a history. Uh, let me have a look. I want to try and get that window up, but I seem to be struggling with that. Roger, if you see so, it, can you just read it out for me? It, it, it's uh, regarding the Esri SAP integration. Um, yes. Is this just a simple plug and play or is unique setup and configuration required for each organization? I know from the HANA side, as long as you've got the geo coordinates um, created inside the software, that's all we have to do from the HANA side. And I'm Correct. not sure from Correct. your side. So, so there's, there's two ways of looking at it. It's exactly as you said from the HANA side. If you've got your coordinates or you've got your 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 spatial information that gives you that 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 capability, then um, then you're good to go from there. If you are trying to access a SAP HANA database from some of the Esri software. Um, I'm, I'm not too sure the user how familiar he is with the Esri software, but it, it's it's as simple as as a drop down menu um, on, on on the search tab, selecting your SAP HANA database, and then it displays all your data. Um, it's it's become a plug and play for users using any older SAP uh, versions uh, that are not so not the SAP HANA. There is some integration required, but if you're using SAP HANA, it literally is just plug and play. Right. Uh, in terms of resources, um, it's it's very easy to find that. Um, uh, on the Esri website, help files. Um, it's 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 really really simple. It doesn't look like there's um any more questions. So so is this the first Hannah Sig remote webinar? <laughs> <laughs> oh wait. There's another question over here. Uh, can you clarify how the SAP ESRI data model would work with the existing SAP modules? Is it still planned that spatial columns are not licensed for use in SAP schemas? Um, okay, it, it sounds sounds a bit more technical. Um, what what I can do is. Um, Genevieve, if you can send me their, their name and email, um, we, we were planning on having one of the um, one of the guys that does all the SAP integrations with us today. Um, but well, I suppose because of the environment, how things are working these days is becoming a bit more challenging. Um, so, so yes, I, 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 I take that question offline and, and I will definitely get back to that person. So Neil, um, maybe if you could just email the, the team on the call, Genevieve, or Johnny or myself. Yeah. Uh, that particular question, and then um, we can look into it. I think they're referring to how does um, how the geospatial data would be be uh, stored within, say, S4, and would that require a separate license? Um, okay. So we just need to look into the the details of that. Yes. Yes. That's fine. Okay. No problem. Okay, so there's another question. Um, he's running two tenants in Hana Express. One is spatial enabled, and the other is not. I'm also exposing the feature classes as RESTful services, but haven't seen a difference in performance. Is there documentation or links you can provide to test the differences? Okay. Yes. Okay. No, definitely. There's no problem. Um, I don't have those links with me, um, but, but I mean, I, I can provide those um, on, on how you would see. Look, the, 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 biggest, the biggest reason why, why I suppose we, we like using with SAP and I is because of the speed. So there's a definite um, uh, increase in, in performance. Um, 
but yeah, I'll, I'll provide some material for that. Not a problem. Um, so, it's in, so it's interesting that he chats about HANA Express. HANA Express is the mm. free version of, 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 of HANA, fully featured, um, available up to 32 gigs. Um, and it's a great system if people just want to test drive um, ESRI HANA capabilities without having to purchase a license, then it's yes. a really useful thing. But again, Lucky, all we've got is your name. Maybe if you also want to drop an email, then we can make sure that we get back to you uh, with a little answer on that. Okay, this. Not seen any more questions coming up. Well, look, it's definitely been a learning curve doing things this way. Yeah. Uh, I think we're all going to become very experienced at this in the future. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, are we going to end the corner? I think we should. I've got everybody's email addresses from the registration list. I have taken right. down the questions as well. Um, Johnny, if you'll just send me your final presentation, um, yes, yes, then I will be able to distribute it and I will put you guys in contact with everybody that had asked questions. Great. Perfect. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.